It is the evening. It is the evening. It's been one of those days. How are you today? You worked hard, I understand. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, you're always yeah, excellent. Yeah. The hardest working person I know. I've never seen anybody work like you do. 48 hours yesterday without sleep. I thought that was kind of amazing. <laughs> Just don't let your don't let your immune system drop. It's not a good idea. And the day of rest is coming up. <laughs> So, um, when Claudia and I spoke about doing this, it was because both of us were confused. Uh, not Claudia, I certainly was, but Claudia has a handle on just about anything that pertains to toxicology and things like that in environmental and health medicine. Um, number of master's degrees from Michigan, DDS, of course, um, some fascinating things done with lasers on TMD in particular, which I think is amazing. She's been a speaker for what, NBC, ABC, health, wellness, that sort of thing on their various programming. Central Expo. And a consultant to the U.S. Congress. So you're, you're the, your background is expansive and extensive. And the, the discussion this week, the seven lessons, are going to be an attempt to sort of really look at the truth of COVID, behind COVID, and to see if we can distill things down to a very cogent narrative. Because up until now, it seems that what we've had is misinformation, mistruths, a lot of uh, confusion, even in terms of guidelines, which are different literally everywhere, uh, disparate openings, elimination of lockdown. So the best place to begin is at the beginning. And you were talking to me before about when things went amiss at the lab in China, which everybody seems to recognize is the source but there were warning signs that were not recognized a long time back that would have changed things if attention had been paid. And there were international teams that had gone there. The story, my dear, is now yours because you know it so well. So let's start there. So basically the Wuhan lab, uh, virology lab grade four viral strain story, which released was released to the international um, um, uh, community in December. Mm -hmm. The viral strain was sequenced by an international team in Asia in January. That is a very separate and very distinctive story from what we are speaking about in terms of COVID-19 as a condition, at least here in the United States, for reasons that include as early as last year, fall September, October, for certain by, by uh, November, there were chief complaints uh, in our practice as well as other facilities across the United States. And I heard of several ones from California months ago, uh, confirming that uh, patients, you know, in our conversation with patients, um, um, they referenced four to six weeks flu-like symptoms that would not uh, essentially subside. And so when we, when of course I, I heard that, like any other clinician, recommendations to see the primary care, get well, stay home, rest, when you're better, we will see you. And so things have gone well, with the exception of during those months that individuals had to take care of themselves. Now, the Wuhan story comes in, which of course, it, it incorporates a lot more policy and other nuances which need to be discussed but again that's not for the purposes i would say of what our discussion should focus on because it is quite intriguing uh you know when it comes to to that uh to that strain at the same time let, let me let us be reminded that when we look at um scientific modeling in the laboratory you know and studying the disease we and, and, and even the therapy we have to model the disease so i'm going to leave it there and perhaps the sequence, uh, you know, and the and the next sequence will, uh, you know, will will tackle the the Wuhan uh, um, component. Well, you know, everybody wants to know what we're going to be doing now, but I think the the understanding of this is probably equally as important as PPE and everything else that we're running around doing now. If we don't really understand it, the vaccine is months away, probably a year away, after all the clinical trials. But the issue in hand, of course is that we had uh, COVID boredom. You know, we had basically, you know, get me out of the house and all the jokes and the memes that went running around. But the problem is that the terms like uh, the modeling, the scientific modeling, the uh, everything that was going on, understanding that this was a mutant strain, RNA, 
you know, all these things that people weren't interested in. And they were, there was very little, at least from my perspective, um, relationship to things like ARDS, okay, acute onset hypoxemic respiratory diseases. There, there are viruses out there. We've had MERS, we've had, um, you know, the HPV, HCV, HIV, viral hepatitis. It's not like there weren't issues before. They weren't pandemics. But as you said, maybe this pandemic, again, was just ill-conceived by virtue of the failure to respond quickly, adequately. There'll be finger pointing enough to go around when this is under control, and I'm sure there'll be congressional hearings and whatever. But that's not the issue. The issue is if we don't come to understand it and we only react to it, it's going to come back because we're bored. We want to get back to life, but can we? And so, you know, so I'm sorry, go ahead. Well pointed. So essentially it comes down to understanding what we are facing. The virus itself is quite benign. In certain situations, it takes longer to shed or to be combated, etc. It appears that actually, even by the robust um, numbering and sequencing, which basically, you know, it wasn't as aggressive as the MERS or the previous MERS or SARS, right? Um, the fatality rates were still less. And so, you know, when we look at solution, what have gone, what has gone wrong, what should have been done differently, is evaluate the virus itself get all the infectious disease specialists, that means multidisciplinary specialties within medicine and dentistry, private practice and public health at the table if you would like to tackle oncoming future epidemics or breakouts because it all gets to the same bottom line, comorbidities. It's all about how the systemic in, uh, profile responds to what it's facing. So I have a question for you in all of this. When it began to show up early on, I, I know it's a cytokine explosion that caused the respiratory distress, but the comorbidities that you're talking about, the sequence of issues that were problematic for patients, this is just general malaise. Some of it was antibiotic controllable, correct? To a certain degree? Okay, so there was this, well, it's a virus, you can't use antibiotics, but that's not really accurate. You could. It isn't. That's the reason why it's important to look at the virology the tropism, what is the pathogenicity of the virus or the pathogen within systemic profile? And here's the other thing. None of the data were differentiated ba based on ASA systemic profile. All the data was com completely compiled together with ASA1 healthy otherwise patients or minor components to ASA2, 3, 4. And when you're looking at a a deemed controllable profile with medications, diabetes, cardio, it really isn't controllable because of the fact that these medications may give an index of output of solid, I would say, test result that says, yes, blood pressure is controlled. It doesn't mean that the underlying mechanism of the dysfunction that the medication is supposed to be addressing has been really addressed. It could be a band-aid, it could be a bridge. There are many different ways in which to control and deal with chronic conditions or acute conditions. By virtue of those facts, it's important to understand who it is that we are dealing with in terms of systemic profiling. So my recommendation would have been, if I would have, for instance, been you know, in charge of recommendations, you know, recommending uh, uh, what to have done, um, Severe chronic patients need to stay in, in indoors in, in the appropriate facilities, need to be uh, seen properly by the interdisciplinary team, and of course, have the comorbidities addressed. I also want to uh, add one more thing. It is very interesting that for the past five years, um, there has been also epidemics of, let's say, measles. For instance, in Maryland, we have seen breakouts of, of uh, measles for the past years. When you have a population that's undergoing existing breakouts, of course they're going to be more susceptible to something else. So it goes back to allowing for the patient to have access to the provider, allowing the provider to have access to the patient, and not coming in between to mitigate, to uh, interfere with that with that access.
So if I understand you correctly, because obviously we're dentists, um, we know our patients, we know the drugs that they're on, uh, we can appreciate, for argument's sake, that if they've got X, Y, and Z inflammatory disease, they're on prednisone, they're basically, uh, you know, you're dealing with uh, hypertension, you're dealing with uh, uh, COPD, things like that, you've got heart conditions, uh, ischemia, stents, whatever. My, my point being that with all of a dentist's recognition of drug therapies, what our patients are on to control them in terms of the stuff that we use to do treatment. Um, you know, we, people, for example, they were having respiratory problems, so they were lying down instead of being prone, so you don't end up with hypoxia. All of these things that we do daily when we deal with these people, we weren't asked to help. We weren't, we weren't to, guys, you're dentists, you deal with this all day long, the, but the doctors, the public health people, will look after it, but they don't treat patients. We do. So, so what was the disconnect? Good point, very good point. I'd like to first uh, just make an intersect on the aspect of the, the immune compromise. First of all, in an immune compromise profile, vaccinations, are not always recommended. Okay. So the first discussion of this solution we are strongly looking for, by the way, which already we've had for decades, I just want to say that, okay. um, is not vaccinations. Vaccinations are meant for those situations and pathogens which are so robust, so difficult to combat in an even healthy immune system, let alone a compromised one. So we reserve those opportunities for things like, um, 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 what is the word I'm looking for? For, for the vaccines that we, we are, the measles, the, the et cetera, um, you know, um, HPV, um, situations where the virulence of the strain is significant. We don't want to um, further compromise the situation by adding on additional vaccines. And this is the reason why I would say even an anti-cardiogenic vaccine wouldn't necessarily, you know, be longitudinally placed because we are, of course, here given to, um, to promote oral hygiene and that includes the toothbrush and instructions. So putting burden on the systemic profile and we as dentists, you know, here at this list dentist, we always look at the systemic profile, not just what patient is taking now, but historically. Because historical data in the systemic profile gives incredible amount of insight into what the patient can and cannot handle. And the customization that follows that um, can be, of course, heightened and utilized to uh, help the patient get through the process of whatever intervention they need or prevention, giving them an added therapeutic input and also minimizing the toxicity component as much as you can during the process that the patient needs to have access to the treatment. And that's what we do in medicine and dentistry. So it's why did it, why did you, I'm sorry for interrupting, why did the associations, I mean, let's, let's step back for a second and look at it on a fairly simplistic basis. It began to show up a long time before we got panicked. It was there. So the warning signs were ignored. I know you can blame who, you can blame the CDC, you can, you know, there, there's always blame to go around. But the one thing that, from my perspective, was not done is, they left it to public health, which I understand, it's great. But public health didn't draw on the existing resources in the community. They didn't go out to the AMA, to the ADA and say, guys, look, we have a problem. Let's take full advantage of your resources, our resources, talk to the dentist, start to explain to them early what needs to be done, talk to the doctors, look at potentially using steroids, maybe to knock things down with regard to the inflammation that was causing all of these respiratory distress situations. I, I, we, we're hearing, you know, the, the, this happened to a child, that happened. There's always outliers in everything, all right? It's not as if this is, you know, there's no trend. It's an outlier, but everybody's reacting because it's on the news cycle. So my question is, rather than listening to politicians tell you what was going on, and I, I get the whole thing was politicized. That's just reality. You can't, you can't change it. But why did CDC and others not go to the physicians to be more than just first responders, but to get into the diagnosis, to predictability, get all the medical researchers, not corporate America? What was the breakdown that basically set this into motion 
And not only how do we prevent it, but if there is a second wave, which from your perspective, we're in now because they missed the first one. Yeah, since February. So to answer your question, sure. Ken, which is that very pointed. Um, I'll start with this. Public health is private health. Uh, is really public uh, private health. So private health, private practice is public health. That's the reason why public health experts, you know, they have the luxury of looking in retrospective analysis in terms of kind of getting the average of where the vector of direction is in pathogenicity or phenotypes in the population at large. But it's really the private sector clinicians that engage on a day-to-day, real-time uh, engagement with the population. They're the ones that get the real-time data. Mm. Not the public health experts. They get, a little, they get it afterwards. One other thing to point in public health, there's sometimes, I mean, many times they're looking at correlational uh, approaches because it gives certain type of nuances. But it doesn't mean it's mechanism. So when you look at a study, you have to take into consideration, is this validated by the mechanism? Now, going back to the private sector, it is like I said earlier, with, in conversation with my patients every day to day, I'm the one that really gets to see, and you're the one, and, our, and every individual clinician, whatever the specialty is, we are the ones that really get to see what is the situation in real time of the profile of the patients. And those are variation. They're never homogenized. They're never generalized. Every individual is different. So public health needs to learn to come in discussions and conversations with the private sector because the gatekeeper to any clinical protocol occurs in the private sector. Right. There's also other nuances and factors we can discuss here, but for the purposes of the COVID-19 situation, I think you know we may want to just focus on this. But you know, um, having said that, why CDC? What what they could have done differently? Implement what they already have. Universal standards precaution, bloodborne pathogen. It's already defined. The actual standard defines the definition. And so we, as clinicians, irrespective of uh, dental medical specialty, we actually, as dentists, right, specialties for the past 30 years plus, we have implemented outpatient dental surgeries. Yes? In mm-hmm. dental space. Yes. In every discipline, successfully. So if anybody knows about outpatient dental surgery or outpatient surgeries or care, it's the dentist. So by virtue of, if you want more insight, yes, there should be a encouragement. But by definition, you never have the whole picture until you bring everybody to the conversation. Well, this is the thing. And, and, and more so, we ran around like chickens without heads because there wasn't nose swabs, there wasn't testing, there wasn't this, there wasn't PPE. I get it. I understand the implications of all of that. But there was data they weren't accumulating, which was basically comorbidities, their sort of reflective analyses of patients who had these issues, segregating that part of the population first. They knew it was people who were older. They knew it was people who had diabetes, heart disease, kidney problems, whatever. So why did they look at the population as a whole, get everybody panicked, and then not Put those people aside, I don't mean like forced, forced, whatever. That sounds so horrible, you're not going to put them into camps. But you, you just sort of use people's information to advise them first, okay? Not the whole population, you're all at risk, given. But these are the people that are high risk. So why did they not make the effort initially to just say, look, you're high risk? The, the comorbidities were talked about by the scientists, not by the first responders, not by the dentists. Those were the primary issues. Those were the issues, not the outliers. Why did they not make every conceivable effort to make sure those people knew what they had to do first? Great question. I can't answer that for for you because I'm not them. But I can say this. Every single point, legitimate point, which which you have just made, actually lies already as an answer in the hands of every clinician across the United States. For sure. So the reality is that we do need to coalesce as a body. But my point even more specifically is that a lot more value actually is in private practice and the hands of private care uh, practitioners and clinicians more so than the perceived generalized public health uh, 
population studies component because first of all, it's a real time issue versus something that was and obviously time passed, you know, time sticks talks. So, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't wait for us. And the other component is that it's at the time of, of need, the patient needs care. And no one can really speak for that, nor render that better than a clinician. And that's okay. what we're called to do. So, so the, I, the couple of questions that come up here. Number one, it was the blanket approach, which always threw me. The comorbidity patients should have been addressed. The elderly, like they should have gone into the nursing homes and done whatever they could, you know, they, and they did, but they delayed it, unfortunately. But there were other things that weren't done. And we've talked about it briefly. And I'm not a holistic, I, I you know, I, I, I value it, but I don't understand it enough. However, there are all kinds of things that are done from an anti-inflammatory anti standpoint. Some of the things that were advocated by politicians were a bit whatever, but things, things that were going on, we were in panic mode. The only, like it's, you know, you're laughing in the dark, you know, you laugh in the dark because you don't want to be scared. So then you got the spacesuits, you got the memes, you got the bad jokes. So everybody kind of deflated their ranks, but nobody was saying immunomodulate, right? Sleep, stress control, the use of zinc, which is valid in anti-inflammatory situations, flavonoids, um, melatonin, vitamin C, vitamin D. This one is everybody's gonna laugh. Elderberry, which has a very substantial anti-inflammatory capability. And if all of, I mean, if we just looked at the holistic health of the population per se, and made strong, cogent recommendations, so that if people were doing this, even if it was psychological, they would understand the demands on them, instead of looking for these sort of bizarre, sort of voodoo uh, cure-alls, maybe, maybe that whole perspective on improving our general health might have started to make a difference, if that had been brought to the fore. You make a valid point again, and I say, from my perspective, I see it as a complete disruption into the patient-doctor relationship. Those very things that you have listed, those protocols, were already executed more than a decade, more than that, even currently. And yet, suddenly, they're being completely interrupted. And they're being limited to emergency, deemed, in certain scenarios, it's almost like a translational into an industrial type setting, which we will talk about later, much later in the segment. But the reality is that we live as multi microorganism, microfloras components and, 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 and individuals. Uh, there's, there is no legitimacy for achieving sterilization as we are engaging in every day-to-day -day life, including visiting our first care uh, practitioners and interdisciplinary team. Though there are exceptions, we're talking about intensive care units, we're talking about transplant care units, again, going back to applying by virtue of the logic that requires, that is required by the protocol, all of which, by the way, is, again, I'm gonna circle back to the original, the standards blood burn pathogen, and universal precautions. That's, that is what deems appropriate and superfluous to the clinician to have the opportunity to exercise their license, their knowledge, their experience, and what they, they can do for the patient when he needs it or she needs it. Not later, because in health, time changes everything. Okay, so I want to, I want to sort of circle back for a minute to sort of tie all these threads in. Essentially, we had an epidemic back in October and November. By failing to recognize the signs, we ended up with a pandemic. So second wave hit back in February, even though it's not counted in that way. Again, as I say, there's always gonna be blame game. Nobody wants to be accountable. That's fine, I understand, that's, that's real. That's the way things go. They, they didn't go to the dentist. They didn't go to the doctors per se, the private care people. They went off on these tangents and had wonderful TV shows and talked about it endlessly, and nobody understood a thing that they were talking about. They didn't deal with our systemic health, as we said, immunomodulation. I'm leading this up to dentistry, by the way, in a second. They didn't deal with comorbidities. They didn't get the dentists out there to really, if the dentists had been given the opportunity to advise patients who had issues, 
There's 200,000 dentists in the United States. Hi, Janice. Just, hello, you have this. Be careful, you're at risk, whatever. All doable, all doable. Contact tracing and everything else, but all identify that group. And, they not, didn't. and not only that, but you would have allowed for uh, herd immunity. You would have allowed for this to have literally narrowed so much more. And, you know, there is a somewhat of a silver lining that it, it highlights some of the issues in the healthcare sector mentality as a whole. And here we are conversing about that. And that is what is important to identify, you know, like separating the wheat from the chaff. Mm -hmm. Here's what, you know, has gone wrong. This is not something that happened yesterday or last year. The errors that have been missed or, or executed have, have been, have already treaded significant amount of historic implications which led to here. So I am an optimist. You know, I believe strongly that, uh, you know, we are all here together to work and to essentially represent our patients. But I have to tell you something. Our patients are starting to question where beforehand they weren't questioning the integrity. They weren't questioning the license. They weren't questioning the expertise because of the fact that inconsistent, erroneous, false information were being distributed. And I have to just quote one thing. I was reminded this week by someone, a leader, a world leader. Churchill, Winston Churchill said, there's nothing more valuable than the truth. Nothing. In fact, it's so valuable that it's often surrounded by bodyguards of lies. And the real, and now he was talking about, you know, obviously intelligence, uh, you know, warfare and such, but we can certainly learn from that. Here we are, I'm seeing toddlers playing with science. I've said this over and over again. Instead of allowing the experts, to do what they do and what they've done, not intervening and cutting off access from patient to provider, but essentially encouraging, we have more research, more technology than we've ever had. We were able to handle HIV, HCV, HBV back then, 30, 40 years ago, without the technology that we have now, without the Watson project, without the software AI modulation, and yet we dealt with it. And by the way, dentistry has never felt or experienced a setback because of it. No. And so, because dentistry was able to challenge it and address it. And they did it by PPE. They did it by uh, infection control. All of the things that were exactly in place in a dental office. So I, I don't want to belabor the point, but the thing that has consistently bothered me in all of this is, why did they shut down dental offices when they didn't go to the dental office and do data mining? They could have basically gone to every dentist, issued a guideline, collected the data and said, here is the population at risk. Pull them out. They've got the data. They didn't do it. Instead, they shut us down and they said, OK, you're out of you're out of business and you like you have no place. You just go home and sit. My argument is we didn't need the data. We have the history, we have the expertise, and we should have been allowed to uh, engage into what is happening in the phenotypes uh, in the population, uh, respond appropriately to the patient's request, as we have done before. And I would say that um, it highlights issues of uh, lack of cohesiveness in the medical sector and not allowing, again, I'm repeating myself, interdisciplinary medicine and interdisciplinary dentistry to communicate with each other. And also, by the way, core scientists as well. We're talking about virologies, we're talking about immunology, we're talking about uh, you know, um, infectious disease specialists, we're talking about the, the, the complex component. And we have to identify, as we look at research as clinicians, we have to identify between correlational studies, mechanism studies. We have to identify you know, in terms of what study does have basically statistical significance, evidence, component, and what study is suggestive. And that application in real time in private sector is really the key and also, by the way, should be allowed to be um, illustrated, um, you know, before consumers at large, not just, for instance, each clinician, of course, engaging with their own patient. This is what has not been done. And I think that the fact that we've had gone through what we've gone before, it highlights some of the deficiencies and lack of communication allowances for this. So let's take it into the dental office and see if we can put walls around this. If 
Oh, a simple question. If you had a choice of having a surgery done in a surgical operatory in a hospital or in a well-designed surgical operatory in an implantologist's office, where would you feel you were safest six months ago? <laughs> I have to tell you, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, you know the answer to that. I do know the answer. I just want somebody else to say it because you're an expert <laughs> and I'm a schlepper and Adonis from Toronto. Yeah, so, we have the answer to that. And it goes back to if you apply the standards that have been rendered, universal law of precautions, uh, blood work pathogen, if you apply the standards, you're set. You protected your patients, you do protect your patients, and you'll continue to protect your patients. Now, hospitalizations and things of that sort, larger entities bring on more nuances like nosocomial infections. These come from a more industrial type setting. It can't be matched with the private sector clinic, which has a more controllable confinement, which is a plus. It's an advantage. And so this is the reason why I'm, I'm perplexed <clears throat> why suggestions are being made to industrial adaptations of these small sectors. I mean, goodness, we don't want to become, you know, NASA-like equipment in small entities and satellite uh, locations because it will significantly limit access to uh, to clinicians by the population at large. I mean, the, um, you know, the uh, cost itself will be prohibited, but we'll go into that conversation. I think well, we're going to get there, but the issue at hand yeah. in terms of all of this is, so we waited for guidelines. There, some of them are, they're, they're somewhat chaotic because they seem to differ from state to state. They certainly differ in Canada from province to province. If we discount all the other concerns, salaries, expenses, the business end of all of this, but we still are applying it in a sense to what we're doing in the office right now, cost of PPE. Do I need uh, N95 mask or can I use type three? Is that okay? You know, my assistant is making something that loops up the buttons on my, I mean, you know, it got crazy. And I'm not suggesting that it isn't necessary. That's not the point but they didn't even standardize PPE except for the mask, okay? Um, so there were basic rules. Wear a mask, avoid crowds, keep your distance, wash your hands constantly, you know, learn how to cough like this, and just be logical, okay? But, but that, and so as it relates to the dental office, I understand, don't put 12 people in a waiting room, don't, you know, everybody needs to social distance, but invariably, when we used to cross the threshold between the reception area and the treatment area, what, what are we really doing that different right now that's causing everybody to run around, oh, I can't do, like, really, what is, what is the difference? You always wore gowns, you always wore masks, most people wore hats, you always wore gloves, so now you have a shield. Okay, that's fine, I get it. You need the scrubbers because we're gonna talk about aerosols in a minute. So, but what's the panic? What's causing this panic? So, well put, you know, um, dentists and interdisciplinary dentistry has done amazingly in technological advances as well as implementing technological advances in the private sector, far outweighing the counterparts in the medical space. That's the, that's the bottom line. For sure, for sure. So when we're looking at, you know, what helps mitigate any type of contamination, whether it's COVID or HIV, let's compare those two. Okay. So what, what really helps protect the patient, the staff, the space, space design, technology, microscopes, lasers, um, rubber dam, appropriate, uh, you know, irrigation, logical, one, two, three, we have a dry field with a rubber dam, no more. The pharyngeal space is not even, doesn't even have access to the area where we work. So this is what I mean about, we must protect the, the, um, um, the virtuous capability of the standard to always meet any requirement by adapting it as we do and we have done historically to every protocol, perio, ortho, endo, oral surgery. Um, you know, the list goes on. So essentially, I think that um, um, I cannot say 
you know, that um, improving on anything, you know, uh, has not been done. It has been done. Let us exercise it. In terms so, of the mask, uh, the mask example, yeah. we see, for instance, and of course, we know this by mechanism. It was only a matter of time, but has been reported in the media, for instance, individuals now seeking their uh, uh, dermatology uh, specialist uh, to uh, problems with the mask. severe, as well as pulmonologists, decreased respiratory. So here we are, healthy patients. We're basically mass, we're mass uh, encouraged to decrease their oxygenation when they are in completely ambient space. Yep. It, it's, 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 a, it's an illogical, uh, it's an illogical. Uh, well, they're, they're recommending patients wear nose filters. You got a rubber dam on with a nose filter and that's sort of, an, that's sort of like a, a, a harbinger of panic on the part of the patient. Let's talk for a second about the, there's been like a tremendous amount of discussion with respect to um, the scrubbers, the air processing devices. Some are on the floor, some are in the hall, some are suggesting that you put them in the HVAC. Once again, we've got company after company selling these things. There's no standardization, there's no SIO, ISO considerations, but I like the one that's in the corner because it's small and compact. Nope, I want the one that looks like a refrigerator in the hallway. Nope, I need five of those. What? <laughs> Where is the logic in all? I mean, first of all, you have to clean your filters. I mean, it's like if you have to clean a filter, you've got stasis. I don't understand what is going on. I don't understand. Like, it's money. It's money. And it's crazy. Come up with a standard, you know? The standard exists. You have to, you know, you have to, you have, you are already in compliance when you are in your building. When the lease is signed. The building itself, it meets municipality regs, it meets industrial regs, aerosolization, all that is evaluated at industrial level. When you are bringing in these nebulizers or additional mechanisms which make the environment more wet, you're looking at greater risk of contamination. That's the bottom line. And so, you know, again, we, you're taking on, as I said, a uh, much larger requirement, which first of all, is not necessary. Second of all, it is not more advantageous because when you look at the mechanism of action in terms of volumetric space with the intensity of the air particles, the types of air particles present, you're going to see that you have just engaged yourself in a more um, temperamental situation. Now, here's the logic. Do we really need data to prove all that and put our population through that when we know from mechanism evaluation and from other specialties? We're talking about regulations, policy, you name it. Experiences industrial, industrial occupational situations, industrial space. Do we really need to have another study prove all that? No. It's given to by virtue of the experts, evidence-based, as well as the implementation that has already occurred for the past decades plus. And um, so... You know, as I said, I, I, um, I am, I would say, um, um, optimistic that we take this opportunity to learn from the deficient thought processes or incomplete thought processes uh, that have occurred and have been essentially probably, uh, you know, uh, latently um, <laughs> uh, allowed, uh, you know, in the mentality of the various different uh, uh, compartments that subscribe to the healthcare sector, but as, as experts, we really are lead leaders. We are the experts, and we have to be allowed to lead. But you just made some interesting interesting points. Um, they're they're showing that there are issues wearing the mask. People are running to dermatologists. The question is, with the deficiency and able to you know, the oxygenation and such, are there going to be respiratory issues? The masks are not impervious. There there are issues. Um, you know, so, so you're, you've got that as an issue. Um, they, they, if, as, as you say, if you're containing the volume using these, these nebulizers. So who, who actually thought about this before they made the recommendations? If you're putting something in and it's creating other problems, that doesn't imply a thought process. You know, if it, you know it's not like nobody ever wore an N95 mask. Those consequences had to be evident. But again, the knee-jerk response, um, you know, the presumption that we didn't have aerosols before. There were no aerosols in a dental office before. You were, you were cutting into teeth, 
you had bacteria floating around, if you had heart valve replacement, and there was strep mutans and strep viridans floating around, how come the patients were dying of SPE? It's just, I, and again, I'm not trying to sound strident, I'm not questioning as if I'm Dr. Fauci, but there's, there's, you know, when you sit back and you sort of distance yourself for a minute, you have to say, okay, was I that sloppy before COVID? No, no. I did implant surgery. Was I that sloppy? No. So did I worry about disinfecting surfaces? Yes. Did the patients have immunity? Yes. If patients came in, as you say, with these various diseases, yes, I was immu immunized. Understood. So did we have to get nuts right now? Wearing spacesuits and oxygen tubes. Aside from the fact that all of that's going to impact on the quality of the dentistry, whatever people say, you're restrictive, you're uncomfortable, you're hot. Is that essential? I mean, you can raise the bar, but is all of it essential? You know, um, it would have been wonderful for uh, the leadership to incorporate dentistry and the specialty of dentistry primarily um, for the added reason um, of, um, by virtue of having the virus be transferred through the mouth. Obviously, the other option is the nose, which will be an ENT specialty, as well as the eyes, ophthalmologist. We do know, however, is that it requires a certain concentration of the viral particle to launch a deemed potential impact of infecting the site so that it translates then into an immune response by the body, etc. And as a matter of fact, there was a study coming from Germany in the last month that essentially showed that. Now we've had these studies on every other pathogen as well as virus. This is a, an understood logic and acknowledgement of how we look at potentiated pathogens. Just because there's one, two, three, four, ten particles doesn't mean you're going to elicit an immune response. Right. It's go it can be washed away. Having a mask be put on would impede the potentiated, much more easier um, debridement of having the patient wash away instead of being soiled with the mask they're wearing for 20, 30, one hour minutes. Right. And so, you know, going back to the mask issue, you know, National Academies of Scientists, some of the studies indicate the, um, for instance, in laser particles, right? Lasers obviously can uh, generate much more precise um, uh, cutting, of course, vis-a-vis uh, -vis other options. Aerosolization of particles, even though it may travel less than the typical aerosolized uh, air turbine or water dispersed, uh, depending on uh, the density and intensity and the, the velocity you know, of the air jet or of the water jet, etc. cetera. Um, the particle of the virus penetrates the masks. Yes. It does. yes. The wetness is the wet particle. So if you can see that the person is soiling the mask within a couple of minutes, let's say they have increased salivation, their dentist did wonderful things for them and they have optimal oral health, they're going to soil their mask much more readily than somebody with xerostomia, right? For sure. That virtue would render a much more recurrent reinfection, much like, for instance, the equivalency of, let's say, active herpetic lesion in the first 24 hours to 48 hours. There's potentiated spread of the herpetic lesion uh, within that time frame. And we know in dentistry, it has been shown that we have to mitigate and, and surround and coordinate certain processes and steps of dental treatment around that reality. Now, there's no standard that's released outside of what has been evidence-based, shared, journalized, uh, journalized and um, of course, uh, logically implemented by expertise. And um, so what has happened, unfortunately, is increase the cost, permeating false information, factitious data, and now having been solicited, instead of months ago, I had received my 99.8 or 9% particle type mask because that's what we use as the dentist and have used for a very long time. Um, 
Now I'm basically being uh, solicited by uh, upholstery manufacturers giving me a mask at incredible amount of fees that's washable. Yeah. And so suddenly we're actually <laughs> minimizing and dropping our st the standard of the universal precautions by multiples in the wrong direction. So here, I have a question. And again, I, I mean, I don't mean to sound uh, pedantic or I'm not trying, it's not just a question of devil's advocate. But I was an, I, I was an endodontist. I only, obviously, I you have to use rubber dam. It's not, it's not, it's a standard of care. I mean, maybe not worldwide, but nobody does root canal without a rubber dam. I have to use Javex bleach in order as my primary irrigant. High speed evacuation. I was not paying every patient to replace the clothing because of Javex aerosols that were basically covering them. So again, I'm not suggesting that there isn't a need for more stringent aerosol control. But I, I mean, in, with the rubber dam, you are much more able to sort of collect things. They're saying don't use cabotrons. I get it, but people were using isolate devices as well. There were things that were available. So again, I, I appreciate the now coming up with aer aerosol shields. I think those are amazing. I think those are going to be very beneficial. They're going to be they're going to be disposable. All of this, but what keeps throwing me is the PPE. If you are taking things that are causing your face to get irritated if you're basically restricting your airway or and you're basically creating a wet environment which allow things to propagate who, who thought this through you know was it just overkill was it you know we got a shotgun we got to do this 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 and this so nebulizers this, but, 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 but did anybody actually sit down and say look we had all these issues we where's the advocacy where's the advocacy right now for the fact that all dental procedures in the mouth require rubber dam placement. <laughs> Here's the thing. The bottom line is that we have patients that are customized patients. They're all profiled, unique. Not one is the same. And we cannot generalize. The protocols are to be rendered by the clinicians, and the clinicians know what to do. Their staff know what to do. There's a signing up when you obtain your license, when you go to the credentialing, and you have to exercise that type of care and make the accommodation, whether it's a ASA1 patient, two, three, four, or a special needs patient, or whatever a requirement is necessary. Why? Everything is at risk once you enter a dental medical space. There's always a give, but we always focus on the get, minimizing the risk, optimizing the get, and that's why we are healthcare providers. That's our role. That's what we can do. There is no sterilization, uh, you know, spatial uh, um, uh, parameters that uh, that can be applied. It, it's unless you're in space. Exactly. There's no hundred percent certainty that what we're doing is going to make sense. I appreciate the extra taking the extra step, the going the extra mile, but I keep coming back to the obvious. The one thing that would produce extensive aerosol in a dental office was the absence of a rubber dam. The one thing that even with these crazy inventions like Isolite, there were ways of restricting aerosol. We have shields now, that's great. But my point keeps coming back to the fact that if you are changing a gown when you go from operatory to operatory, your hat, your whatever, your shield, is some of this insanity, this panic that onset, we're getting, we're getting people walking in the door, they're selling soup to nuts, you know, this device, that device, fantastic, uh, beautifully Hollywood produced commercials on you should buy this and buy that. Theoretically, there has to be, as I said, we were prepared to begin with high speed, of, high speed evacuation. Now there are shields for it, which I think is brilliant because again, it does, it is protective for, for scatter and splatter. But to sort of bring this to a close for today's number, the two standards, and because tomorrow we're doing what? Patient, doctor patient access, I believe it is. Patient doctor yeah. access. Yeah, so, if anybody's watching it tomorrow, I mean, who knows? Maybe they think we're crazy. Um, no, no. So it, it, the take-home message here is dental aerosols were always an issue. COVID is high risk. There is no herd immunity. There's no vaccine as yet. But there really isn't a vaccine for HIV either. You know, there isn't a vaccine for the common cold. 
you know, the flus. You have to go every year to get another flu shot. All I'm suggesting, and from what you're saying, is be prudent, be careful, but like you said, customize the service to your patient. They have a comorbidity, they're higher risk. They don't have a comorbidity, they're over 60 or 70, they're higher risk, even if they're reasonably healthy. So instead of running around worrying about PPE and this, that, and the other and nebulizers, maybe we should adjust our focus in terms of how we're treating them, not what we're wearing to treat them. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Well, like I say, Claudia, either they're going to come in the door tomorrow and shut your practice down or whatever because they think you're a heretic. Absolutely or not. We could have handled patients and seen patients throughout all this. As I see it, basically, I wasn't, and other clinicians, we were not allowed to have access to our patients, and our patients were not allowed have, to have access to their clinicians. That is telling. And not only that, um, we need to look at the science to, to, to allow for um, wise decisions, timely decisions, and allowance to actually implement the um, progress that dentistry has contributed to the medical healthcare sector yes. as a whole. So, you know, I, um, I uh, stand with my colleagues who are optimists and who are going to highlight the silver lining and accentuate um, situations and logic or uh, uh, parameters who, uh, which have been ignored. And this is our opportunity to improve. You bet. So listen, I'll see you tomorrow night, same bat time, same bat channel. And uh, have a good day. All right. You take care. Bye. Have a lovely evening. Okay. Bye.